I guess, I guess. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the relationships in this show. We have a guest tonight. Normally, we like to hide them for the first couple minutes, but I've posted uh, a million times. There's photos. There's there's all the social medias, and we just started Instagram. Uh, so if you'd like to follow us there, please do. We have Matthew S. Robinson, a very hey. prolific hey <laughs> uh, filmmaker, as 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 agreed to join us, and we couldn't be happier. Matthew, welcome to the show. Oh man, thank you for having me on here. I've been really excited to be on the show, and it's. Uh... You know, it's been a really cool like gig that you guys got here. It's this is like a really cool operation. <laughs> hey, thanks. Well, thanks uh, it for showing us, up. It took oh, us absolutely. a long time to get here. If you happen to click on our earliest shows, uh, it was a mess so, technologically. When we got streamyard, things turned around a lot. We put money into equipment. We started practicing what we want to do. I don't know, like Jeez. the things like you're supposed to do when you have a talk show. <laughs> uh, bashing your head against the wall until the audio works right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't click on our old shows, Matt. Please yeah. don't. Don't, I, please. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of want to. <laughs> and, and when, I, when, well. I, when I see that intro, I also like, wow, Wagovi sure has changed me. <laughs> like, uh, so uh, also, I want to announce that in an upcoming show, I'll be reaching out. I'm looking for people who have lost a, uh, a large amount of weight and how it's impacted their lives and their relationships uh, and kind of talk about that. Well, I also, I have a nutritional coach lined up to make sure that I don't say anything outrageously stupid. So uh, look forward to that. But today, again, we're with Matthew S. Robinson, who's done a lot. Look him up on IMD. IMDB, that's the IMD is a whole other thing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you'll find some bios on his own website, MatthewSRobinson.com. And uh, absolutely check out everything. Uh, we're digging. There's so much to dig into. That's the hard part. Like We like to do research <laughs> before we talk to people. Zaz, uh, can you give us some of your rundown? Like, how many? We had a count so, of how many films you've made. <laughs> oh God, it was I, the the IMDb was extensive. Zaz said, "Yeah, yeah." Well, that was it. Was actually one of the things I was going to talk about before we get to it. The, go the, for it. Uh, yeah, it was just it was. Um, I, I don't want to go over like uh, too many things. We, we said before the show what what are the questions you're tired of hearing about, which is hard. I would imagine for somebody in your position, because it's like you've 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 been writing, you've been directing um, plays, talking about and, it all constantly, and it's just like you know, I was trying to like come up with you know questions that you wouldn't hear of before, and I was just like, all right, what 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 thing do you want to not? Uh, what role is too intimidating for you at this point? And again, mm -hmm. I'm probably getting way far ahead, but um, it got like you said you started off when you were uh, you would have been an architect or I'm sorry archaeologist when you were a, a child and you met James Cameron and and that kind of took off from there and I'm actually stealing your thunder so I'm going to let you talk for a minute get my picture off the big one <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'm glad you did the, the research you know I mean that's part of the thing that I love to do is part of why I was very interested in archaeology for a very long time I still love archaeology obviously just not professionally I love to see what archaeologists are doing, what they're discovering. I love to write historical fiction and sci-fi and like horror and all this jazz, but that's all kind of linked to that research. Like I'm working on a script right now where the main character, the protagonist, is an OSHA compliance officer. And so I kid you not, I have been studying OSHA regulations, watching all those OSHA safety videos, which some of them are very final destination. In terms, some of them are more gruesome than horror movies, to be quite honest. And uh, and then I'm I also, know, I know. The way, let me interrupt. Okay, I know what you've watched. The Canadian ones are the best. Oh. Yeah, absolutely, bar none. <laughs> Literally, we did an entire comedy episode on a previous uh, <laughs> project where we would like we would pause it and say, "What do you think is going to happen next?" And if you saw the one where they had the big pot of boiling water or oil, it looked like in Canada. Like you could not. And then the the woman on the ladder in the in a store. <laughs> It's it's gruesome. It's yeah. it's fairly horrific, but it's also kind because of how they shoot it and how they like, they do it. It's like it's kind of funny. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> we laughed. We laughed. Yeah, for hours. And can I just say a small note that we're not giving enough credit to to the fact that like the special effects they use, practical effects. None of this, you know, no offense to CGI, but like practical effects for a, a what a five minute spot like that's that's expensive. We didn't talk about it, but those were actually snuff films. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they really, yeah, they 
are. They're legal snuff films. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's. I, I don't know if you've seen the German ones. Uh, the well, German the actual snuff films, artistic. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's one called like uh, Super Klaus. And oh, okay. um, it's like Sam Raimi Evil Dead. Like limbs fly off. Like there's one point a metal shard goes through someone's body and you see it from the POV of the shard. So you see it go into his stomach and you see the guts as it comes out the other way. It is insane. And then he's like bifurcated. Like I, I don't know how much, they had, must have had so much fun shooting those <laughs> because they just go completely over the, they get, realism goes out the window. This guy is missing his legs. He's just a torso now and he's still alive. And he's just like, oh, you know, why weren't you more careful? And then he gets my <laughs> Oh, I want you awesome. to know that I have that already typed into a tab to watch. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> sorry up on mine too. Boy, we gotta yeah. start off. Uh, so tell us tell us about this project you're working on because I hope that this is all involved. Yeah, no, it, it, I just want the main character to be an OSHA compliance officer. It's a play, or not a play, it's a movie, and the, it's it's a little different for me. I've, it's a script I've been working on for a while. It's it's a little personal. I used to work in construction, and uh, it's, it's really about consent, and it's about the kind of human connection, and I felt what would be a better person, like a better linked job, than safety compliance. And because it is, I think it's one of the ways that men, not to get too in the weeds here, but I think it's one of the ways that men can quickly understand consent and safety, and I'm not okay with this. I think, you know, it, it's it's a little too going through the front door if you just have it with, you know, relationships, sex, and everything. If you have it like, huh, I don't think there should be this much weight on this bearing. It's like, that seems unsafe. I should I should go and talk to somebody about it. It's still, you're still putting your trust in a lot of different people and in the system that someone has your best intentions. So that's kind of where I'm going for this. Now, do I need to know all the OSHA regulations? Do I need to know what the CSP and ASP tests are to become an OSHA certified uh, supervisor? No, but I, there's just a part of me, whenever I'm writing a script, I like to get really deep into the research of it so that's kind of my that's my archaeology fix whenever i'm writing or directing <laughs> that that is the best bookend i've ever heard so comments that like it, yeah uh i tell you like that makes a lot of sense to me that you love the details of something and the history of it that you know you can tell any story from that point on uh and i myself i'm working on a, a three book series uh in my head and i actually have the hundred years of history before it because I have to have those details. The, the characters might never mention any of it, but it's there. It makes everything else click. And I and, and I get what you're doing with this is when you have all the details, everything kind of clicks. Like you know why this person's acting this way and why they react this way and why the other characters probably aren't. Because uh, they didn't go through OSHA training school. They just hated the <laughs> manual when they worked construction. Like every, I worked construction as well. So. Uh, <laughs> I want to. I wanted to build some background on you real quick. Where did you grow up? How was high school? How did you end up where you live now? Like, just uh, you know, give us a quick the le le elevator speech of who you are, where you came from, before we get to what you're doing. Yeah, I grew up in a uh, DC proper in uh, Northeast DC, right by Rhode Island Station and Montana Project. So that's where I grew up. And then when I was about nine, we moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, and I went to a school. This is confusing. I went to a high school called Wyoming High School. <laughs> that is located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. It's very confusing. We we're called the Cowboys, all this jazz. Um, <laughs> that's really where my love of film got to really get practice. I, I made some short films in high school. I made a film in high school, my first feature film. And then from there, I decided I needed to really come out and get into the LA industry to kind of break in. And so I went to Santa Monica Community College for two years and then transferred to Pepperdine University, where I have uh, that, some yeah. family uh, connections. And uh, that's where things just exploded for me. And I got a lot of great experience working in film. And now I've lived out here in L.A. for about 16 years. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> uh, like, I know how hard <laughs> it can be. Uh, when I hear people that six, I, I moved to Vegas and I didn't last two months, you know, <laughs> like, um, <laughs> that'd be tough. That's tough. That was that. 
It, well, the, the, it, I think LA would be harder. The, the Vegas thing was um, everything in every apartment is like triple the deposit because they know you're not going to last and you're not going to pay your final water bill. You're not going to pay your final gas bill. So they just load it all up front. Uh, so you pay it no matter what. Um, and I figure LA has to be similar, right? <laughs> Like just yeah, you're not going to be here long, so we're going to get as much money out. It's of you it's as we can. very expensive. Yeah, and I hear it's getting worse. Absolutely, so. and a lot of people don't last long here. So th- I, that's why I'm yeah, impressed. Like, it's getting a lot worse. <laughs> but you seem like a bit of a workaholic, uh, <laughs> which is fantastic. Uh, when you when you decided to dedicate yourself to film reading, were there people you had to cut out of your life? Uh, to get there or people who cut you out because you weren't Ooh. around in the same ways. I, I know you kind of made a change in your life when you moved there. Uh, but was, was there still that, that transition of, I need to be in these groups or these circles or people that said, you know what? I, I know you're working till uh, 14 hour days and you're not spending any time with me. So forget it. Did anything like that? Uh, of happen. You know, I had, I certainly fell out of contact with many of my friends who I had in high college. Uh, not intentionally most of the time. It was just kind of, you know, you grow. No, it looks like we had a little internet glitch on you there a second. Yeah, it looks like we're having a little a little problem with the internet there someplace, but. Hey. Yeah. And I've noticed that you have won a number of awards from the fringe uh, local to you there in California. So how has that experience yeah, been? Because yeah, no. that's that's a great festival wherever it is. It's a lot of fun, and uh, that's really cool that you've you've got some awards there. So how did how was that? Yeah, actually, I did not plan it, but like that right there, that little blue statue, that's one of my fringe awards. Um, nice. That was for a play I wrote. Uh, and produced called uh, Olivia Wilde Does Not Survive the Apocalypse. Uh, and we uh, we won Best can Comedy you, for that one. That was really cool. Can, can you awesome. tell me where I could find that? <laughs> yeah, what? It's, it's a... I'm, I'm stopping right now to go yeah, see. I mean, we, don't, we, we don't have a... Um, we don't have the play uploaded because, you know, we want certain right. sh- theaters to, uh, you know, right. buy them and we did record it. We did record the final performance. But if you look up Olivia Wilde's Not Survive the Apocalypse, you will find a couple of reviews and articles about it. Uh, we got some really good reviews from people. Um, it was really successful. And that was with the Hollywood Fringe. We, we had a great show. We oversold every show. And then we won Best Comedy, which is a very hard award to get. We had a stiff competition. I did not think we were going to win the night of the award ceremony. I was like, there's no way. And uh, we, but we had a great cast and great crew, and we were able to do it. But um. You know, with the Fringe, I've been doing Fringe since about 2016 at the Hollywood Fringe. We've been very fortunate. I've had a couple of really good plays um, come out of the Fringe Fest, and I produced a lot of plays recently. One that just was in New York, another one that's in Oakland right now, and another one that's about to start up again in a, for hopefully a very big run at the Chopin Theater in Chicago. <laughs> hey, uh, quick two questions. The first is, what did Olivia Wilde think of this? <laughs> so she did tweet about it and she said uh thanks i think that was her <laughs> that was her <laughs> response that's gonna go in the playbill so like right? <laughs> just thanks, uh the other yeah. question is can i can i change <laughs> your display oh. oh the other question is can i change your display name because it's cutting off your face and i just want to change it up a little bit and i want to how's that Absolutely. please this is yeah, I don't, I don't want to block here. There you go. Yeah. I was sitting there waiting. I'm like, I don't want to. He's he's an uh, artist. He's a creator. Oh, there you go. We could do that too. How about we we switch switch that before we even finish? Who was supportive? Who really really pushed you and helped you in those mm. first years? Let's give them credit. Name oh, them. I mean, my family was out. very. My family was very uh, supportive. My mom and dad, they always supported me doing going into the arts. They always supported me really heavily. My, um, I was gonna give up at one point. I was at Santa Monica College. I was, I was just having a bad time. This college was good, but it just, I didn't have a car at the time. It was, I had to get up every morning at five to get the classes. And 
I just was feeling very discouraged for about a month. And I called my mom and said, I had just gotten, I was like, I put an application to transfer to Ohio State. And I was like, you know what, mom, I think I'm going to go back to Ohio State. They've got an okay film studies program. And maybe I'll come back out here down the line. And my mom was like, if you do that, you are going to never come back. And I want you to know that me and your father will stop, will cut you off if you do that. We will not support <laughs> anything you do. If you're <laughs> this easy. Like, it's over. And so she was like, like, buck up and finish this and then don't worry about it. You're gonna be fine. And it was like, it was what I needed to hear. It was what I needed to hear. Uh, but my whole family's been that's, very supportive and I've had a lot of support yeah. friends too. That's that's amazing. I love I love hearing that. Like instead of the don't go there, you're never get, uh, you know, it goes either way sometimes with families. And uh your family went the very opposite route of it, it will cut you off if you don't if you quit. Um well, but sometimes I think people <laughs> don't take that as supportive either because it is because your mom was telling you like no you you should do this you should finish it and sometimes telling somebody like it's okay if you don't want to do it that's not the support you need supportive sometimes is hey get your shit together go do yeah. it and good and, that's awesome. and it go says your mom and good for uh, you for following through on it i know you and i believe in you like nothing is stronger than that yeah exactly this isn't part of any of the questions I thought about asking you, but have you incorporated them into any of your projects? Are they on film in any of your films? Have you asked and they said no? Um, or is you waiting for something bigger? <laughs> you know, because I, I know I, I would tend not to put my family in it. Oh, well, yeah, I it, it's kind of like I don't know. It, it, it seems a little perverse to put too much of my family into things. Like it's, it's a, like a <laughs> yeah. recipe for disaster. You know. Well, what about a, like if you um, had a field, you know, a, a field of dead bodies, or something? <laughs> people in a studio audience or something. Um, I would. Like, Here, I would, this that... is my cousin. He's playing on the corpse moves. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so w one thing uh, that I do like th that I'm really honestly curious about when, when you build relationships with people you work on in a film, is there ever an expectation to use them in future films I, from actors to Foley's to whoever's there, you, you, you build a friendship, a working good relationship, and then you get another film. Do they reach out and say, Hey, we worked well before I need work. Or is there an expectation or is an expectation the opposite? Like you don't do that in the filmmaking business. You don't. Is, you know, even ask if you could be in the next film. You know, you know that's a good question. And it, it's honestly, you kind of have to read the room. Uh, a lot in, in this industry is being able to read the temperature of the room and how well you're doing and how things are going. I typically don't, I, I'll go up to people after this, if the shoot went well, I'll go up to them and say, hey, this was great. Hope to work with you again and in the future, you know, to reach me. I never really do anything forceful or demanding about it on my end. And most no. of the time I, you know, most people, that's how they respond. They don't, they're not looking to force their way onto a project. They'll, they'll usually make it known that they would like to work with you again. Um, there's been a few times where an actor who I haven't worked with or a crew person I haven't worked with has been very pushy about being put into a project, which is a very risky dice roll because if it, it, it can make them seem desperate in a bad way, um, it can also kind of put pressure on you to find something for them and then it's not quite the best role for them. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that casting someone or hiring someone in the wrong position for the wrong project is just as damaging, if not more damaging than not hiring them at all. Uh, so, you know, it's, I would say, you know, kind of be careful about that, but I tend to just, Hey, if I had a good time with you, I'm going to find something for you down the road, particularly with crew members, but you know, actors, sometimes it's a script that requires that ca cast. Sometimes it doesn't. And you just kind of have to live with that. It's, it's not personal. It's just, just how things go. Hey, can I ask a related yeah. question on behalf of Zaz? <clears throat> um, <laughs> Can Zaz so, be in your next movie? No. Any of your actors, actresses, uh, I'm going to call them coworkers. Any of them uh, you ever get romantically involved with? <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> oh, good question. I mean, that's a saucy question, but it's a good question. Uh, I have a pretty, it's not a hard line rule, but it's it's definitely a rule. I try not to date actresses in general, not even ones Sounds that I'm like working with, idea. just yeah. in general. Yeah, because one, actors are flaky and unreliable outside of being on a film set. They are emotionally, they need constant validation sometimes. And it's, it, it can become exhausting I, I, from my experience. I'm not saying that that's all the case. There's some actors I know who, if the situation was right, I would leap at the chance to be in a relationship with them. But I typically try to avoid it because it causes so many things. Then if you cast them, did you only cast them because you're with them? You know, maybe you're writing a character now, but now you're writing it based off, off of this. Oh, right. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a really valid where, point, you know, too. I yeah. Think... A little background noise there. That's weird. Yeah. yeah sorry yeah. about that. So it's, it's dicey. Yeah, sure. No, it's fine. Yeah. It's like, I was looking sure I didn't step on you. But no, it's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it, yeah. So the yeah, the whole piece is and by the way, audience, all listening, that's the correct way to answer that question. Uh we have that one come yeah. up every show for the past 37 shows. Yeah, I, I phrased yeah. it as coworkers for a reason. We've Yeah, we've I, I that caught that. Recently. It was yeah. it was about as subtle as a train wreck. Yeah. It was uh yeah. <laughs> I was letting Matt know so that he was in on the joke. Oh yeah, I sorry, Matt. I feel like we've been friends for like decades. Um <laughs> yes, every show we've done all I 77 shows. Well. <laughs> <laughs> we've had the coworker question come up where someone's like i see this coworker, uh even though it's my boss he's super nice to me should we date lol and it's like no that's a, not a great idea by any means but anyway so uh i wanted to tie this in to, uh, last week i think on reddit somebody posted it asked me anything reddit question uh, uh it was or ask reddit and the question was have you ever dated somebody who is an actor who became famous and what was it like and nobody had a good experience. It was always very needy, very insecure, needed constant self reassurance. And even when they named actors who were generally known as respectable, kind people, they said they still had a very strong undercurrent of they needed accepted. They needed, even, even after uh, a totally different conversation, it would always come back, do you think I was good in that? Or something along those lines. And that was kind of mind-altering. So I'm really glad you brought that up, Josh, because I was like, and again, no, when there is no stereotype that fits everybody, there is no all actors are not the same, people are people, and that makes them different. Like, that's why, uh, any medication might not work for you. You're a human being, you're different. So, uh, anybody looking, I, I don't want to offend any actors, uh, because yeah, I mean, I'm sure the first person who would say that, however, would probably be an actor <laughs> that, that you know, well, they're a little flaky. <laughs> Let's get that number up real quick if we can. Uh, if we anybody can wants that. to call in and ask Matthew Robinson a question or have they need advice, uh, we'll invite Matthew to, to answer questions if you feel like Matthew. Um, we don't get a lot of callers. People don't like using the phone anymore. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's weird. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, the phone yeah. number 412 yeah, I used to Give us a call. I don't want to do it either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I spent seven years as help desk, so I hate the phone. Microphone, fine. This, it just feels weird now. Um, hey, well, let's move on. Uh, give us a call if you want. Uh, one of the questions I do have, uh, it's related to what you do. You had a really successful GoFundMe for, I guess, one of your latest projects. H how did... Uh, I see so many GoFundMes yeah. not go the distance. Yeah. You did, and you you finished. You have the film finished, I believe. How did you build that up? How did you get the people there donating and getting word around and uh, it, that's an impressive, as well as making the film, you made the finance happen. And that's not something you probably went to school for. Or I, I just, that part impressed me because it's another thing that you did to make your art happen. Well, you know, it was, I started off with, I made the pitch deck first. Uh, I made the pitch deck. So I knew exactly how I wanted to market it and what it was like, what it was similar to. And I tried to really lean onto the angle that I knew was going to work uh, to get people excited. So one of the things I did was it was kind of a Neo Giallo film. We have a couple shots that are kind of Raimi inspired. I think one of them is in the, um, one of them's in the, the demo reel that I have where we, the camera kind of tilts into someone's face as he comes, walks into the frame. 
And uh, I wanted to show people the storyboards, the idea, the shot deck, how unique this was going to be and what it was play, paying homage to. But I also started very early. I knew that I was going to run that campaign in about, about two months before I started running that GoFundMe campaign. I did like polls on Twitter and my Instagram. And I was like, what should we call it? What should be the name of the film? Hey, what kind of like, what are we thinking for? Which costume idea do you all like better? Vote on it. And it gave people a sense of ownership over the project. They felt like they were a part of it. They felt like they were already okay. contributing to it without having to give any money. So by the time I was asking people for for cash to help get it made, people already were invested emotionally about it. And that kind of kept people kind of tuned in. Also, All right. you know, I, I, I've done a lot of stuff for people in this industry, usually for free or very reduced rate. And so I did cash in some of my chips with some people to get a little bit of money. But I knew that there were some people, if I texted them the link, they were going to give me some money because I had done a couple solids for them. So all that kind of coalesced, and then we were able to get the money to, to make the project. I got the graphic up. <laughs> <laughs> Good time. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I love this this uh, this uh, movie poster. I love how it, it very much feels like a topic I just mentioned. Uh, VHSs of the eighties. Is it? It just it looks beautiful. This makes yes. me <clears throat> maybe somebody will think that Jay Leno's in it. Yeah, I, I saw the actress name and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, I reread it. Yes. Yeah, no, it was just Keith Gillette. Like I said, he did a great job designing it. I wanted that old look because it. I wanted to feel like a DVD or rather VHS you would find in the 80s going into the horror section and be like, let me check this out. And so it was nice. really, really cool how he was able to do that. And we gave him some stuff. He, you know, he used his own hand as a model, but it, in, in Bloody Bloody Coda, the lead, Jenny Leno's character, who's a tremendous actress, uh, she plays a woman who cannot speak. She's, she's had vocal cord surgery. She's an opera singer. So if she speaks, yells if she does really even whispering is a risky thing to do but if she screams or yells that's it for her opera career she'll, her vocal cords will never recover and so now these thieves are in her house and she's trying to escape but she cannot make any verbalization and um she can't yell for help she can't do any of that kind of stuff and you know they it's it made us such an intense uh thrill ride but it was a lot of fun shooting that and so we wanted that in the poster really quick and there you go voila <laughs> Beautiful. It's half half quiet place, half home yeah. alone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. That's that's what I'm sure what he was shooting for. Um I, I okay. wanted to ask you, uh, now that you're a multi award winning and growing filmmaker, do you find trust is harder to give out because people see more value in you? You that they might take your trust in a direction that you you didn't have to worry about earlier in your career. I'm sure it's only going to get worse as time goes on. You know, I'll be very grateful for my career to keep growing. And I'm sure as that happens, it, it will get harder. Uh, I don't want to name names. I definitely don't want to give any information that will no, make no, 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 no. feel bad or no, bad. No, no. But um, I will say that there have been a few people who I put trust in who didn't do anything like, you know, betrayal, nothing dramatic, just didn't deliver. So in a way I needed them to. No. Hmm. I tell you, it felt like it was dirty somehow. Like you gave them that and they didn't respect it. It uh, wasn't necessarily yeah, betrayal. Yeah. It just was lack of respect. No. Yeah. And just like, you know, when you come up, particularly when you're getting paid, you gotta, you gotta deliver at a certain level. And they just right. didn't. And you know, I, I can forgive, I can forgive not the performance level not reaching where I needed to be, but it's harder for me to forgive uh, a, a, a sense of laziness or a sense of sloppiness. Uh, because when you're working on a set and you don't come prepared in a perfect way, or not even a perfect way, but you don't come prepared in, the, in at least a somewhat competent 
trying way, it affects every other department. And I've had some people who caused damage to a film that was very hard to course correct on. And so, you know, I don't get mad about it. And I, you know, I certainly forgive in the sense of like, you know, we all make mistakes, but you know, they go on that list of like, I'm probably not going to work with them anytime soon. And it, it sucks. You hate to do that, but it, I mean, that's just how it is. I'm sure I'm on that list for some people from some mistakes that I've made. So, but you know, you can't, once money gets involved and time and all this other jazz, you can't really give that much leeway. And also uh, a film, it's the shooting of the film takes a couple of weeks or a couple of months. It's the, it, the film lives forever though, when it's done. So yeah, you have to make that. This is going to be forever, and I want it to be right. So, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, we have like months of <laughs> preparation usually, uh, or at least you know several weeks. So it's like, hey, you know, I've I've given you all the material to be prepared for. If you don't come to set prepared with the stuff that I have given you to be prepared for, you know, not something that happened that was out of our control, but if you don't do your job, it, it's. There's no in, there's no industry there's no job in the world where if you get the material to be ready and then you get there and you're not ready do they usually keep you on staff <laughs> it just doesn't it doesn't happen it doesn't exist yeah. have you had somebody who <laughs> made a mistake with you who's able been able to fix that in the future and if so how did they do that what is the best way that you've seen somebody attempt to fix a mistake on their part Maybe I'm just a little soft hearted, but honestly, it was just them coming up to me, owning the mistake that they made and then finding a way to prove that they would do it better. Or just, you know, committing themselves to be like, I'm going to do better next time. Honestly, eight out of 10 times, if you just acknowledge that you messed up and that you didn't do what you're supposed to do, but that you're going to do better and you try to I see that you're trying to do better, I'll usually give you another chance. Like you know, at least one more chance on that because it's like, I get it. People make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Uh, it's the people who kind of just sh shuffle off like they didn't just screw over the project or cause some very problem. And then you're like, well, okay, cool. Like they just seem so unaware or just willfully ignorant about the mistakes that they made. Those are the people I, I don't want to work with again. But the people who own it, yeah, I'll work with you again. I don't think that makes you soft. It makes you a reasonable, decent human being. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I thank you. I like to think so. <laughs> I, I want to. I want to go the other direction on this. Very other direction. Have you run into your own super fans yet? And what was it like meeting the first one? Kind of. I don't know if "super fan" is the right word. I don't think I have any super fans quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe never, but I have run into some people who are fans of my work, and it is—it's always bizarre. It, it's you know, right? it's, it's like an out-of-body experience. Honestly, I've had people like recognize me on the street, and I'm like, "How do you like?" I'm like, "Mad," and I don't recognize <laughs> their face, and I'm like, "What's going on?" <laughs> um, particularly in the theater world, that happens to me quite a bit. Not so much in film, but. You know, there it's it's starting to happen. Well, I'll run to someone and they'll be like, "Oh, hey, I, I recognize you. I've seen your work." Or, you know, let's work together. No, I've never run to anyone who's been like weird about it. Uh, but it, for me, it's more weird just because it's happening. It's more weird that like someone's followed my career and and knows who I am. You know, it's it's weird when I get someone who's like emails me out of the blue and say like, "Hey, you know, can you meet at this cafe? I got this play I want to produce." And, you know, I was looking for some advice maybe when I come on board and I'm like, oh, OK. So, you know, that's how I kind of feel. I'm also really bad with faces. So sometimes I don't know if I've met this person before. <laughs> I've just forgotten or uh, like, oh, wait, no, I, I do know this person or like, oh, no, this is someone who I've never met. <laughs> nice. So you understand it, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I've never been famous. Right. I was in a uh, garbage yeah, uh, yeah. punk oh, metal oh, band yeah. for a, a very short time. And a year later, I had somebody who was at a show come up and quote lyrics that I didn't even remember. And that, that was my level of, this is weird. <laughs> like, I, I was surprised people really showed cool. at the show, let alone remembered anything I did. <laughs> so we've taken, up, we've taken up over an hour of your time, and I want you to feel free to say I got to go at any time because you're a busy person. You're leading two projects coming up. 
feel free to plug either of those. I could talk to you for another hour. Uh, so don't let me, cause I'll do it. Uh, I actually have more questions and notes that I wrote down. I want to ask, but the one I want to get to next, um, because it's related, you know, you always have something. What is, I'm not going to ask you, you have so many things out there and I'm sure you love them all equally because they're all your children. What was the most fun thing you've ever worked on? Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, and who's been your favorite no actor question. you've ever worked I, with? I've never <laughs> <laughs> Josh, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't, <laughs> the actors will kill me. Go watch this. Oh, but I, can, I can do evil. favorite project. I think I can do. I've never been asked this question. I've done a lot well, of interviews. Favorite, most never fun. Been asked this question. Uh, the most fun it doesn't have to be your favorite project. The most fun you know, you've had doing. Uh, uh, so Olivia Wilde is definitely up there. That was a really fun project. But right the year before that, in 2018, I did a play called Black Ball, The Rise and Fall of Negro League Baseball. And yeah. that was lightning in a bottle with that cast. I directed that one. I was I wrote it. I did a little just research for it. My cast knew their lines about a week after I gave them the script, which is, it was, it's a feature-length play. That's almost unheard of. They were so plugged in. Uh, I had this wonderful cast led uh, Asia Lynn Pitts, David J. Cork, Tuan Pope, uh, Robbie DeVillis, and Alex Skinner. And they were just in it. They were just on it. And we had so much fun making that play. And we, I had a lot. Olivia Wilde is also like a very close second in terms of that play. We had a couple of like logistical issues with Olivia Wilde that maybe like lowered the funness a little bit. Like it's like right here. But Black Ball was just something that I may never get a play that smooth again. Like, that may never happen. I might, it doesn't matter. I could win a Tony and I may still never get a play that smooth. And so that was a lot of fun. So shout out to that cast and crew. It was, it was phenomenal. And, and I want to let you know that two of us live in Pittsburgh. Uh, I live fairly close to Homestead. And at least yeah, once, uh, once a, once a, um, week i drive past a giant mural of the homestead grace so um i i think i i really i i wish there was a oh way to my watch that <laughs> yeah so i totally get why it was yeah, awesome we need uh, to there's a special on... place in the heart uh and I, i'll read the script if you give me like an edited version of that <laughs> like whatever i would i would just it sounds amazing uh, I've, I've uh, actually, I'm going to see John Cleese at the end of the month, uh, simply because he's the guy who got me in, interested in comedy and writing as an art and uh, all that. And, and I paid stupid money for the VIP experience because I know I'm only going to get a minute with him and shake his hand, maybe. And I don't care about autographs, which really angers actors. Um, but, um, I, I paid for it just to meet him because he's the guy that like pushed me in a certain direction at a very early age. Which brings me to the question I want to ask you. Have you, when you're in your childhood, you I believe you were born in 1989, so you were born when I graduated, so we might be coming from different levels here. Actors that you saw on TV or your favorite shows or even musicians that someday, like, I'd like to work with that person someday. Have you ever reached out as an adult on any of your projects to these people you would love to work with? Because actors do it. Kevin Smith does it. Uh, uh, the guy who does Bab who did Babylon 5. Uh, I can't remember his name and I should know it uh, again. Hate mail's coming. Like he brought back the guy from taxi, not, not Jim. Uh, he's already had a career, but like he brought back actors. He loved, he put Chekhov on a sci-fi show that level of, he likes this person. He wants them on a show. He did it. Have you ever reached out to somebody you really wanted to work with and tried to incorporate them? Oh no. We lost him. Austin. Uh, there might be some lag. Ignore this. If just keep talking. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, here we go. Funny enough, uh, you know, just uh, genuine enough for Bloody Coda was someone who I really wanted on. She was someone, you know, she was on Xena. She was on uh, Charmed. And I will say, I think the two actors who I would go insane maybe three i gotta cheat and do three i think the three actors i've been a fan of forever since i was a kid who i would love 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 to work with in something would be regina king 
Jennifer Connolly. And then I of course I really think it would be cool to work, even though I, I probably will never get terrific uh to work with. So those are like those are really up there on my list. What is your favorite job in filmmaking? Is it the writing, producing, directing, or acting, or even something else? Ooh, that's a very good question. I I think gun to my head. I would say writing is my favorite, but it's very close with writing, directing, and producing. Producing is so much fun. I love helping get someone's project off the ground. There's a, a very odd joy that I get out of it. I love doing the numbers, figuring out the budgets, the paperwork, finding the team, finding the rental house, getting the best deal, hustling to get the right actor on board. I love that. But writing, I think, is, is my first love. It's probably what I'm best at. It's what I've spent the most time uh, fine tuning. And then directing is, I love directing. I love directing people. I, I think out of the three directors using the role, I'm most willing to give up when people are like, oh, I shouldn't say that because in Hollywood, well, he doesn't really want to direct. Like, no, I, I do really want to direct. I'm not a control freak, but I, I, I do like to direct. But um, no, I think um, all three of those are really good. But I would say, those are my top three in that order. It's probably writing, uh, then directing and producing. Those are probably how it goes in terms of my love, but it's pretty even. It's like children at this point, you know, maybe one's better one day and then the other one's kind of being a brat, but you love them all the same. <laughs> it, it, totally. I, I couldn't uh, pick. I just know the one thing uh, that uh, I think most people would never pick would be editing. <laughs> the editing's the worst <laughs> actually i think the one job that's kind of a post job that i actually really love and enjoy and actually the first award i ever got was for this is uh sound mixing like an editing like creating sounds and finding sounds like i did all the sound mixing for bloody code in a number of my films and it is so much fun i love doing the sound mix i love figuring out like how do we make this sound like a skillet is breaking into somebody's skull like how do we get the best joke how do i make it sound like someone is like a, a moss like creature is like walking across a tile floor and i'll just spend hours with a microphone just figuring out like okay how do i how do i do this how do i make this sound good for the film yeah, you can't just always break celery <laughs> fully work is fun yeah yeah <laughs> No, I wish. <laughs> yeah, Josh is our our, our uh, resident sound guy. Zaz does a little bit too, but like he, he could probably spend all night asking you questions and telling his stories too. Yeah, shit doesn't work. That's the story. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, before before we let you go, last chance for for anybody to call in uh, with questions, and and again, people, you know, that's our hardest part of the show. Four one two two five four four eight two nine. Thank you for being our guest here, Matthew Robinson. I wanted to make sure you get to plug whatever you want to plug, as much as you want to plug, upcoming projects, somebody else's project you want to put word out on, whatever you want to plug, it is your floor. Just tell everybody what they need to be watching. This is October. You have movies they need to watch. You might have friends that have movies that people need to watch. It's a whole month of Everybody's horror, off, suspense, right? and yeah. And it, yeah, now you can promote it without feeling bad. <laughs> well okay yeah well obviously you can follow me at robinson is hide on twitter or instagram that's h-y-d-e and my website matthew s robinson.com uh using my reel you can keep up to date i update news stuff i'm going to post this uh, podcast episode when it comes out onto that my news blog of what's going on with me uh i just wrapped up a short film called Dog Days. We shot that in Portland and Vancouver, Washington. And that was a, a really fun project to do that was written and starring Emily Martz. And I got lucky and got to direct it. And then, of course, Buddy Coda's out and a number of uh, films that I'm still working on in, in the process of doing. So, you know, go to my website. That's how you can stay in contact with me. And, you know, uh, hopefully I'll have some other projects coming out soon. But thanks for having me on. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, I honestly believe we've talked to somebody who we won't be able to talk to again because your agents can be like, he's busy. Uh, so <laughs> no, This was <laughs> awesome. Really, it's been really great having you. Yeah, Thank you. 
you realize he was on the Today Show, the Morning Show, and the Daily Show today. So you're not getting him. So it was great talking to you now. Um, I, I mean that. I absolutely believe you will be bragging someday that you were on our show. Like just, I, I'll brag now, but I mean like, no, 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 we met him. We thought he's, he's for real. <laughs> Hi, caller. Hello. You're on the air. Ooh, that's a very good question. 